Thanks for joining us for another episode of Practical Welding Television. I'm your host, Amanda Carlson. Gas tungsten arc welding and heli arc welding are just a few names for a welding process that is widely considered to be the most difficult process there is. So stay with us as Mike and Larry from Rock Valley College help us make sense of this process, most commonly referred to as TIG. Well, we're here in the shop with Mike, and Mike, as I had said before, uh, I thought that TIG welding was one of the most difficult welding processes to master. Would you agree? Yes, I would, because it takes a great deal of skill and concentration to do it. As you tell the students that want to learn uh, to TIG weld, if they can't do <laughs> this, <laughs> then they might want to practice that, because it takes a great deal of skill because you're... Uh, a lot of things are going on. If you're right-handed, you normally hold the TIG torch in your right hand, and then you're adding the filler material with your left hand. Uh, you have your helmet that you have to get used to, you know, uh, kicking it down if you don't have an auto darkening. And then you have uh, one of your feet uh, running the foot pedal, which is like a gas, uh, gas pedal in your car. It helps control the amount of heat, uh, heat input to your, to your metal. Mike, could you explain the different components that go into the torch itself? Sure. Uh, there are uh, a few components that we need to assemble this uh, torch. First of all, we have a collet and a collet body, and these are matched to the size of tungsten that you're going to be using. Uh, these, this one happens to be a 332 tungsten and 332 uh, collet and collet body, so they need to match. These are what are going to hold the tungsten and the torch. And these are put together and threaded in the end of the torch until the finger, finger snug. You don't need to tighten it down with a pair of pliers. Just snug with the fingers is fine. Then we use a back cap, which uh, is on there to allow the, the tungsten to insert up up into it. Okay. Uh, there are a couple different, uh, or some different lengths of back caps. This happens to be a long one, and this is a short back cap, and it even has some uh, stubbies that are even shorter than this. Allows you, uh, the shorter the back cap allows you to get in tighter places. Okay. And then we have a cup that goes, threads on, onto the collet body, finger snug. We'll insert the tungsten. Uh, if you notice on here, uh, it's colored. That end goes in first. Uh, I normally tell my students to only sharpen the non-colored end because the colored tungsten, that's what designates what type of tungsten it is. We adjust it so that the stick out of the tungsten is roughly about two to three times the diameter of the tungsten itself, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. And then we just snug the back cap up and that pushes down on the collet, inside the collet body, and that pinches the tungsten, holds it in place. Okay. To remove it, all I need to do is loosen the back cap, that loosens the grip on the tungsten, and out it comes. And sharpening, any, any tips on what it should look like? Normally, the way I've been taught is to taper the tungsten back approximately two to three times the diameter of the tungsten itself, which is about the same as your stick out. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in that ballpark. And also, when you grind, no normally uh, people will use a grinding stone uh, to grind it. The grinding marks need to go in uh, in line with, with the tungsten, not going around. Okay. What happens if you were to touch your tungsten to the base metal? Instantly contaminate it. What happens is the uh, the base metal comes up and collects on, on the tungsten. And as a beginner, that happens quite frequently. Mm -hmm. And as you gain more experience, that you know, less less frequent, uh, that happens. But anyway, when it d does happen, you need to stop and go resharpen it. Okay, so now we know all about the torch. Now we need to set the machine. How do we do that? What what's what's the proper amperage? How do we know when to set it at, at what? Well, as far as the amperage goes, uh, you need to set your amperage according to the thickness of material that you're welding. For instance, here we have uh, some 10 gauge metal, 11, 10 or 11, and it's approximately an eighth inch thick, which is 125 thousandths. We would need approximately 120, 125 amps 
to weld it. That will get you in the ballpark, and from there you can fine tune it. Okay. That's a uh, good rule of thumb that I use for most metals that I weld. If you get down to real thin uh, material, take that uh, rule of thumb, and I would even start down a little, little bit lower than that. Yeah, just just to be on the safe side, sure. so you don't blow a hole in the material. Well, that, that was going to be my next question. How do you know if you've got your amp set too high and, and, and too low? If a, uh, beat it, or if the amperage is set too high, you're going to have a chance of burning holes in the material, mm -hmm. and your weld might be uh, spread out more and uh, be flat rather than being uh, convex like it should be. Okay. And if it's too low, it'd be the, it would be the opposite. The, the weld yes. would be too high. The, the, your weld bead would not flow in, into the base metal. You'll have a hard time uh, keeping it running, and the bead will be narrow and, and high. Okay. Too, a little bit too high. Well, let's talk about travel speed for a second. How fast do, do you need to go? You need to go as as fast as it takes to keep the proper bead size. Okay. And what's the proper bead size? Approx I use a rule of thumb of approximately two to three times the diameter of the filler rod that you're using. Okay. Somewhere in that ballpark. Right. And that's not a rocket science where it has to be an exact uh, dimension, but it's pretty close to that. Okay, I have to ask you this question, and hopefully this isn't the first time you've heard it, but how, how do you get good at feeding the filler wire consistently with your non-dominant hand, you know, so you don't have to start and stop and you know, continuously adjust it how do you do it where it's just a, a fluid motion? How do you get good at that? Practice. <laughs> well, I, I tell my students, uh, first of all, is the problem is because of the uh, welding rods come in 36 inch lengths, we take a pair of uh, cutters and we cut them in half. Because the longer they are, the yeah. more movement there is. And for a TIG weld being so small, you need very precise uh, control. Mm -hmm. Next thing is you need to learn to walk it as walk it through your fingers. As you're welding, you're adding the material, adding the filler rod to the bead. This rod keeps getting shorter. Well, if you can move your hand closer and closer and closer, or you can learn to feed it through your fingers. Get comfortable. And what I like to do, I prefer holding a torch similar to a pencil. Okay. Some people learn, uh, start out holding a torch like this. I prefer that they don't do that because you have much better control holding it like this. And then I also rest my hand down on, on the, the workbench. And then my filler material then is fed with my other hand and I also rest it down. It just helps keep it steady. Okay. Okay. We get in position and want to hold the torch, not straight up and down, but approximately 15 to 20 degrees back. And you're going to push it forward. I'm, I'm going to push the puddle, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to add the filler material into the puddle from this end. Dipping it in the puddle very slowly and in the leading edge of the puddle, and we'll get that stacked down effect. Okay. We hope. <laughs> That's what we're going to try for. Okay, ready? Yep. You can see I'm establishing the puddle with the tungsten, with the torch, and I'm dipping the filler material into the puddle that I'm making with the torch. When you get to the end of your puddle, you Lift off on the foot pedal slowly. Well, what else can we weld on? Uh, well, we have some stainless steel. And I can run a uh, bead stainless steel here. We have 11 gauge stainless steel. This is welded on the same polarity, DC electrode negative, but I'm going to drop my amps down a little bit. Stainless steel uh, does not need quite as much heat as, as mild steel for welding. So I'm going to drop that down maybe. Well, 
105, 110, somewhere in there. Everything applies, no technique is the same. When you're adding the filler material, you want to get yourself a rhythm by adding the filler material, it's called dabbing it, dabbing it into the molten puddle, and you want to uh, get a rhythm going so that you have the same amount of material melted off every time. That helps with the consistency and uniformity, and that's what will help you get that uh, stacked diamond effect. Okay, it's my turn, and I'm going to attempt to run a bead on stainless steel. So hold on. Very good. Dip the rod in the puddle. There you go. Very good. Okay, so this was my first bead right here. Not pretty. Uh, but with a little help from Mike, this was my second bead. And then this is my third. So I, I think I made a little bit of a progress there. You made uh, great progress in just uh, three beads. So you picked it up very, very quickly. So uh, with some practice, I think you can make a great welding. A really <laughs> great TIG welding. Well, I hope you learned something about TIG welding today because I know I sure did. But if you need more information, please visit us on our website, thefabricator.com, and click on the welding textile, which is located at the far left side of your screen. From all of us here at Rock Valley, we'll see you next time.